I can predict where it's going to be very far into the future. So now we take two points. They're very close together. They have the same Z coordinate, so umpteen decimal places, same Y coordinate, so the same umpteen decimal places, and the same X coordinate up to seven decimal places. They differ in the seventh decimal place. One of these initial conditions is red, and the other one is green. I teased Tim in the last four lectures, but he wasn't here. So. Okay, so the red and the green points track each other for a while, and then they start to diverge a little bit until right here, where they get torn apart. And you can see both points are coming down from the north, and when they get here, the green point decides, no, he's going to turn around and go back north, and the red point decides, no, he's going to go south. And after they're torn apart, uh, the motion is basically going parallel between these two points. So predictability is good up to about here, but there is no predictability beyond here if your precision is in only the seventh decimal place. This is what sensitivity to initial conditions mean. This is what I mean when I say, yes, CAS means it's predictable, but it, it's not predictable. Yes, it's predictable out to here and beyond. And uh, this is emphasized <coughs> in this simulation. Here is again the Lorentz attractor. And we have a set of initial conditions which evolve under the Lorentz uh, equations. This is the magic point here. Points to the north go this way. Points to the south go this way. This exceptional point goes to one of the points in the system that particularly important to understand um, and miss that. And you can see that things go around and they get to this region and split apart. This is what we call tear. The mechanism involved in creating this stranger tractor we call tearing and squeezing. So that <coughs> points go around and around and around get to here, they're torn apart, and when this goes to the other side, it gets squeezed with the flow that's already on the other side. So two different mechanisms, the only two mechanisms that exist to describe the creation of strange attractions in three dimensions are uh, stretching and folding and tearing and squeezing. So how are we doing on time? But one of the things that we wanted to do is to uh, to see if we could uh, um, uh, develop methods for taking experimental data and determining what kind of a strange attractor it came from. And this is a hard problem. I'll tell you why. Suppose you're taking a high school chemistry class and your teacher gives you a test for two fully. And your teacher says, okay, qualitative analysis, tell me what's in here. How am I going to answer that question? Oh, I see a table, uh, a periodic table of chemical elements on the wall. So I know that whatever's in here corresponds to the sum spots on that periodic table. Because there's a periodic table, you're subjected to a chemistry course called qualitative analysis, and you have to analyze these things. So that makes the problem easy in some sense because you have a list of things that could be in your test tube. Well, we wanted a, a periodic table of the strength of practice, and there was none when we started working on this, so we developed our own. What we discovered is that uh, you can classify strange attractors. The classification is finite, it's discrete, it's uh, represented by a set of integers. I uh, won't go into the details. But the bottom line is that every strange attractor can be described um, by a simple building unit. This is a flat wire. It's technologically obsolete. Uh, you probably can't find one except maybe in a junkyard. 
what we did is modify this so that here's uh, uh, an input end where we can input other pieces of flat wire. Here's the output end with the pins in it. And we've uh, torn this in half. This is the splitting point. It's like the point in the Lawrence tracker that splits from this side or that side. And if you take the output and plug it back to the input, like this, you have a model of the first string tractor where stretching and folding is what's going on. But if you take a bunch of these and plug them together any old way, you can reproduce any kind of stranger tractor. The result is every stranger tractor that lives can be built up Lego style from basic building blocks like this. These are like Legos. You take a box full of Legos and you dump it in front of a little kid, they'll have a field day plugging them together. Uh, you take a box of these things, and dump it in front of a physicist like me, I'll go crazy, plugging them together and saying, oh, look at the strength of tracks that I've got. It. So um, <clears throat> I need three volunteers to demonstrate this. One, two. <laughs> Did I hear you volunteer? No. <laughs> uh, I heard yes. Mandatory no, volunteers. Uh, mandatory volunteers. Okay. And did you volunteer? No. <laughs> you volunteer anyway. Come <laughs> <laughs> you get support. <laughs> it's not going to be scheduled. Yeah. These are not electric yeah. guitars. I noticed you started to make hurt. Stop. <laughs> okay, so these are already plugged together, more or less. Just pulled up the connecting edges, and this one goes. The pins are so bent that they don't stick in anymore. But yeah, hold it up over your head. And the claim is that by taking three of these units and plugging the ends together, um, the outputs of one go into the inputs of another, possibly itself. You create um, a structure like this, and every structure like this represents a strange attractor. And every strange attractor that we uh, can construct, that we see in physics, can be constructed uh, in this fashion. This is one to one correspondence. So, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty easy, actually. The group before you did the hard thing of trying to plug these together. That was what we did. So, um, <clears throat> okay, let's see. Um, so, you're sitting there saying, okay, um, it's quite clear that you guys are having fun. I I, I, I enjoy what I'm doing, and so do my colleagues here. In fact, it's worse than that. You're having an obscene amount of fun, and that ought to be illegal. But, you know, it's not. So, is this any good? And I say, well, yes, it's good, because now we can explain data that come from chaotic dynamical systems, from chemistry, from biology, uh, using chaos and living things. How are we doing on time? Five. Okay. So, <coughs> why would you expect to see chaos in living things? Oh, I'll give an example. <coughs> you built an airplane that you want people to ride in. You want it comfortable, you want it stable, you want it very, very stable. So, you make it big and fat and um, impervious to atmospheric perturbations called the 747. <laughs> so, <clears throat> the thing that you want to ride in moves very slowly when you change the controls. Now you want to design a fighter. You want this to be able to stop on a dime and turn around. To do that, you want to design it to be unstable, as unstable as possible. Today, the fighters that are designed and built are so unstable that you can't fly them without a whole bunch of computers linked in. So, a typical fighter plane has 15, 20, 30 computers around somewhere in it to help the pilot. Turn the computers off, and even the best pilot could not fly a fighter plane. You want them <coughs> unstable so that they can move quickly in different directions. So, that's an engineering principle. You want quick motion, you design for instability. 
So in 